smarter than me. There we go. I wonder why I didn't echo. So, uh, as I said, I was a camp counselor for a long time. So, you know, big parade fields, etc. Uh, and what I do is I work for Red Hat. I'm uh, what you know this kind of new thing called a developer advocate or a developer evangelist. Uh, and so I've spent I don't know about 15 years as a mostly as a software consultant. So a lot of different projects, mostly kind of big enterprise sort of things. Um, and now what I do is I talk to uh, kind of developers who use kind of Red Hat products, uh, in particular Enterprise Linux, talk to them about what they hate about it, and then I go and talk to engineering about how we can fix that stuff. So that's mostly what I do. Um, and that's a little bit about me. So this talk is actually, um, it's kind of essentially about this concept called software collections, but it also, I come definitely from the developer background rather than coming from like a packager's background. So I think I have a lot of biases towards being a developer and, you know, not needing things like QA or, you know, any of that, any release stuff, you know, and uh, it, we'll just send it out there and everything will be fine. Um, <laughs> no security updates, etc. But so just a little bit of, uh, you know, on me. So here's a little bit of my argument. Over the last, I don't know, whatever, 15 years, Linux distributions, um, it, you know, they kind of started in this kind of world where, um, you know, the open source community was relatively small. Uh, the um, even proprietary software and open source software, neither one could you trust basically at all. Um, they, uh, you know, it was all run by developers uh, who didn't really know or care what they were doing. So things like security updates would never happen. Uh, you know, QA if you were lucky, uh, you know, etc. So early on, I, I, I argue that the distributions kind of formed to try to basically solve some of that ease of use problem and kind of redistribution problem around uh, security patches and software and kind of things like that so that you kind of had you knew where you could get stuff from uh, and you could also redistribute uh, things so that they would stay secure um, it was also kind of over the arguably earlier than that but you know over the same 15 years or so is where you know kind of the dynamic linking concept really took off and caught on. You know, there were definitely pockets before that, but it wasn't until, I don't know, like 96, 97, where it was like, it started to become like the way to do things. Um, so, uh, and then the last thing was actually license assurance. Uh, this is, was much less of a problem with proprietary software, obviously, um, although in fact they were hugely violating licenses anyway, but um, you couldn't tell. But with open source, it was a big concern, right? So you wanted to make sure, particularly as open source started to be adopted by the enterprise, that you knew what kind of licenses you were getting into. Uh, also, feel free to interrupt me. So you can tell me I'm crazy. If it's just blanket crazy, though, well, let's wait till the end. So particularly now in the last maybe five years, uh, there's been, uh, and I couldn't find a good graph for this. I've actually seen one before. I was looking at, uh, I was talking about somebody earlier that, you know, kind of just the package count in Fedora, each version is just, it's, it's just scaling like crazy. Um, obviously in something like Enterprise Linux, we have significantly less packages, but even that is still, it's still a nice, you know, strong curve. And so between that, uh, now we also have a, a massive plethora of actual Linux distributions that are reasonably popular. So it's not, you know, three big ones, right, and then everybody else, right? There's, you know, there's a good chunk at the top, right? Um, and then Linux in general is also becoming hugely adopted, particularly in the enterprise, you know, kind of in server rooms in particular, but then even, even to some extent in the enterprise on desktops. Uh, you know, I don't think it's ever, you know, I don't think we're ever going to see the year of the desktop, but, you know, uh, it is in some places. You know, I think it's largely going to be um, the only people who use kind of desktops, and by desktop I mean laptop half the time, are going to be people like, you guys, right? It's going to be just developers, you know, just people who actually make software who use these things at all, right? It's everything else is going to be tablets and, you know, and that kind of tool chain. So we really need to kind of focus on making sure that we can distribute things well. So here's my, here's the extent of the math I can do anymore. Uh, you know, so we have a whole lot of projects 
and then we have versions of each project, then we have it across distributions, and then it, we have versions of the distributions, right? So now we just made the thing massively wide, right? So kind of typically, you know, we, we just do this kind of, you know, take a tarball, right, and then kind of have to figure out the distro's packaging rules, uh, and then kind of figure out how to build the thing itself, uh, and then uh, start to, you know, kind of put that into a package. We've got to follow all these rules and make sure it goes in the right places, um, et cetera. And then on top of that, inside an individual organization, there may be kind of a second set, or third, or fifth, or 47th set of packaging rules within that organization. So you have, you kind of have to solve the problem over and over again. So what would be a lot nicer is if we could kind of say, okay, I have this package, right? And if you saw, I don't know how much of Donnie's talk covered this earlier. Uh, I know he's covered it in the past, but um, you know, whatever that means, right? So a package, but essentially, if we had a, a blob of thing that we could run, say, on any distro, right, that was OS independent uh, version wise as well, so you could kind of go this way, right, for the package, could drop on each one, or you could go this way, right, so you know, version two, version three, version four of the OS. Um, and then the other thing is, can you also, are there can you uh, start to trust essentially the developers to have packaging rules that make sense uh, you know, for their application rather than it being a distribution problem? So lots and lots and lots of people have tried to solve this problem. Uh, here are uh, whatever, six, five that I thought of off the top of my head um, and ones that I could find uh, random easy links for. Actually, I had Linux apps in there too, but I couldn't find a good like place to point people at off the top of my head. Um, so they, some of them solve the exact same problem. Some of them kind of take it from a slightly different perspective. So that's what I think is kind of interesting is to, it's kind of, you know, every piece of software anybody writes has trade-offs. And these people clearly were taking different trade-offs, right? Um, so kind of the environment modules, SEP, and to some extent Gentoo slots kind of all take roughly the same set of trade-offs, very similar actually to software collections, where it's kind of like, I want to have multiple versions of the same thing installed on the OS at a time, um, and I want to rely on the user to uh, choose between them when they're running applications. Um, OS tree, uh, relatively new thing that is really actually about, um, it's really about supporting, arguably supporting debugging. Uh, so you can take an entire set of binaries and kind of swap them out, in and out, and it's for, you know, doing like debugging of GNOME, right? So it's not just one application. Yeah? We're going to look at doing that for uh, software updates. Using OS tree? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Mind you, GNOME, I think, has three or four different ones that all try to accomplish this goal. Uh, there's Glick 2, Glick, uh, it's a, another one too. Um, and then you have Update Alternatives, which is uh, also trying to solve the same problem, but in a very different way, which is uh, I want to be able to switch for the entire OS what the version of something is. So instead of per application, which is what these guys do, uh, it's actually for the whole OS, right? And that can kind of cause some problems, particularly with something like Python, right? So you switch the version of Python in your OS on Linux, right? And bad things are going to happen. Uh, and like I said, there's lots and lots more. So taking some of that thought, right? And taking uh, some of the... So Red Hat has a little bit of a problem where, um, particularly for enterprise Linux, um, a lot of our customers want to use whatever version of Enterprise Linux that they're using forever. And, and I mean forever, right? Uh, because, well, one of the reasons is because the application that they're running on it is working just fine, right? So why would they want to invest, and normally what you have to do is you have to invest development in, you know, effort, a QA effort, release engineering effort into modifying the application to be able to run on some future version of the operating system. If it's a junk application that just does what it does, why would you make that investment? So as a result, they instead yell at companies like ours, right, and lots of other ones. Microsoft has this problem in a huge way as well, as you all have, I'm sure, seen with the, their big EOL announcements. Uh, every time they announce an EOL, you know, and then it'll, I think it's like five times they EOL it, and then it'll actually die. Um, 
So they have this huge problem as well. Uh, they do some other interesting things. Um, look up the uh, Civilization Fix, you know, the video game Civilization, the fix they did in, in Windows sometime. Um, so what a software collection tries to do is let's, instead of having the application kind of natively touch the OS itself, let's put a layer in between it, put a layer of indirection in there so that we can now take this blob that's in between, it might be it might be Ruby, right? Or it might be kind of a full stack. So it might be a web server plus Rails and Ruby and everything else. But the idea is there is a blob that you depend on that's kind of above generally above the actual OS and below your application. So that's kind of what a software collection is trying to do is saying, okay, let's identify that blob and let's try to make that blob portable. So now what you can do is you can say, okay, I have this janky old uh, Ruby app, uh, let's say Puppet, uh, that is running on Ruby 1.8, right? Uh, why is it running on 1.8? The way I hear it is because uh, Enterprise Linux 5 runs Ruby 1.8 and why is Enterprise Linux 5 running 1.8 because Puppet runs, so it's, uh, but any which way, the point is, you know, you take any, any old application or older application and what you can do is you can kind of say, here's this blob, I'm going to guarantee the API on the top of it and then I'll change how it, how it delivers that API underneath um, so that it can be portable across multiple versions of the OS. You also have the problem the other way, right? So uh, there's a lot of push for people to move to Python 3. Uh, however, not all the distributions are ready to make all the changes to be able to move to Python 3. So how do you start writing applications in Python 3 right now uh, without the, you know, kind of borking your, your Linux? Well, one of the ways you can do it is with a software collection. Um, so it's kind of, you know, by the two examples I'm kind of giving, right, you can kind of see it's, it's OS independent, right? It, the OS can, can continue on its merry way and your application can decide to upgrade when it's ready. Um, or you can be aggressive and say, hey, I'm writing something bleeding edge, brand new, and I know I want to use the most cutting edge version of whatever because I'm not going to change it again for 10 years. So let me get that right now and use it right now to write my application. So it kind of going into it a little bit more, um, so it really is, as it says, it's kind of defining a process a little bit more than a product. Uh, you know, so it's kind of a conceptual thing. You know, there is an implementation, but that's kind of what it does. The other big thing that it does is it packages outside of the normal uh, kind of uh, Linux file system. Um, and that's sometimes a problem for, for some of the people, I think, in the room. Uh, and uh, it allows multiple versions to be co-installed, right? And then per application, you can essentially start, or you can, you can say, this application gets this blob rather than that blob. So the way we kind of defined it is um, it installs under opt um, with, you know, the, the L acronym that is the Linux naming that I can't actually say. Um, you go register for a Linux name uh, so that you can get kind of a short code there and then you put your application name there. And that's kind of where it installs. And then you have uh, kind of some scriptlets that uh, know where that is and can provide that information to the application. And the way it basically does it is by fancy pathing, right? So the application doesn't have to know. This is the other, sorry, I didn't mention this part. Um, one of the big differences between the ones that I was talking about earlier uh, and this one is that the application doesn't have to know that it's not the base OS version, right? Which is, I think, hugely important because you don't want to have to rely on your average developer to figure out where it's going to be. And again, to allow for that OS independence, you know, someday, right, the Linux, all the Linux distributions will be on Python 3, and that will be what's at user bin Python. So what you want to do is be able to write the application and say user bin Python at the top, and then it just goes to the right place rather than having to, you know, do fancy symlinks or, you know, or make a mistake and say, or and have user bin uh, Python 3, and then find out now you have to do engineering effort to port it. So in a little more detail, here is um, kind of the way the one for Ruby works um, that we have built. So here's kind of regular 
Ruby, right? Um, you know, assuming that you installed Ruby, the other nice thing about this is that you don't actually have to have, uh, I can't remember if Ruby is installed by default, but um, you don't have to have Ruby installed except for this particular application. So in other words, it doesn't have to be anything in user bin Ruby. It can just be down here. So I think it's pretty obvious, but basically here's the normal path, right? And here is our special path. Uh, you know, we ship a, a Ruby 193 variant, uh, you know, one of these blobs. Uh, it sits under RH because that's our name, uh, and that's pretty much all there is to it. The, this little script here is what does all of the magic such as it is, uh, which it basically kind of provides those paths so that um, the command to run these, which I think is down here, so SCL enable Ruby 193 bash. So what you do is you kind of say, here's the command, right, SCL. I want to turn it on, all right? And then which one do I want, Ruby 193? Uh, and then what do I want to execute with it? So if you just want to get a new shell back where Ruby is Ruby 193 is available, you just run bash. But it could just as easily be, you know, uh, you know, some app, right? Uh, so from a kind of if you're a sysadmin, it would be like an app that, and then you put this in, you know, a shell script or a start script or a something script. You know, for a developer, he's going to drop into bash most of the time. You can add this to your dot profile, and so it's just always there if you want as well. Then we talk about, um, you know, there's basically some tools out there that kind of help uh, make this stuff work. Uh, and so there's some links. I think all these slides are available somewhere. Um, uh, Joe would know better than me. I will email them to Joe. He will make them go. This is the ones that we've done already. Uh, actually, it's some of the ones we've done already. We actually have um, some that are out there for like HTTPD. Uh, 2.4, um, I can't remember what else is up there that's just kind of public. Um, there are some other distributions uh, that are related to ours that also have all of these. Uh, there's a guy I think who's talking next to, uh, who uh, had a hand in those. Um, so I think they are well represented now actually in CentOS, Scientific Linux, and Fedora. Uh, yeah. So Fedora just approved them, whatever it was, last week? Or was it the week before? Okay. Oh, okay. I can always pray. All right, so um, it's getting there. You can, there, there is some of this stuff built for Fedora, but you can't get it in kind of the mainline distro repos yet. Um, so that's basically most of my slides. Um, I was expecting more interruptions. Uh, I invited hecklers, and they're not delivering. Um, <laughs> exactly. That's true. That's true. Uh, so, so here's kind of my argument, right? Uh, and you know, I'm probably crazy, but I think vendors in general are a lot more trustworthy. Uh, and when I say vendor, I mean proprietary software, I mean open source projects, I mean everything, right? Any, any kind of application. I think the distribution doesn't have to take on as much of a responsibility for making sure that all the stuff in the world runs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, you know, is not a high bar. Um, but <laughs> let's, say, let's say are reasonably trustworthy. So they're, they're even more than that. They're, uh, you know, that I think a lot of this stuff, you know, they're, most people understand, uh, you know, most people who do this kind of work, right? Most people, they understand what, um, what's important, how to break their things up. You know, yeah, there's still, there's still faults, but I think there are a lot of them. Uh, are starting to get it. You know, there's well-known uh, libraries for particularly security-related things. Uh, you know, so people mostly use those libraries. I think Bruce Schneier is finally getting through to people and saying, "Stop writing your own encryption libraries." Um, so, same same kind of thing. So, I, I just I think in general they're considerably more trustworthy. So that I don't necessarily think that every distribution needs to package everything under the sun. Um, I also think. Another big reason, right, is kind of redistribution. One of the things that Software Collections has that, that kind of fails and goes backwards in time a little bit uh, is it's uh, a lot of things are considered to be statically linked, right? Because the only way you can be portable across OS is, is if you carry the bits you need, right? Uh, so that means static linking, sort of, right? Or at least it means that it's got to be carried in the bundle. So it can still be dynamically linked. However, it's got to be dynamically linked from within 
the software collection. So one of the things that I, I was certainly confused about when I first looked at this stuff, so if you think about an RPM, one software collection does not equal one RPM, right? A software collection is more like 70, 1,000 RPMs. So it's broken up just like you would do a normal package. It's just that it's all kind of in this one context to say, hey, I'm part of this one software collection. So you do, it is better, quote unquote, than, than straight out statically linking, but you still have the problem of redistribution. So one of the reasons that dynamic libraries are, are nice, right, is that you only have to copy that one file onto every machine. With a software collection, let's say you know it's OpenSSL, and you have 37 software collections on every machine, all using OpenSSL. Well, that means you have at least 37 different copies, right, of that SSL RPM. So you need to distribute that all the way through. However, and judging by the overflowingness of the config management talk, config management is really uh, you know, has really finally taken. You know, I remember the fits and starts, right? I mean, you know, I, there was a huge push for it, I think, in around 2001 uh, and just never quite took, but it's really kind of taken now. So I think redistribution, particularly in, in big data centers, has gotten a lot easier. So, you know, I think that's why we can kind of take this risk. Um, the other thing is, the other risk you have is that now you have a copy. You have 37 copies of OpenSSL. Um, you know, disk space is not that big a deal anymore. So, you know, is it, does it really matter that you have lots of different copies of the same stuff on one machine? Um, and deduping file systems someday, I pray, uh, will be the default, uh, and so it won't matter anyway. Um, the other thing is that I think users are more sophisticated. So I think that they can. Uh, they, they understand the context that they're, they're, and when I say user here, I mean a developer, right? So somebody who's gonna consume one of these software collections. They're way more sophisticated about what is going on underneath uh, and can uh, usually figure this stuff out. Yeah? I was gonna say that the nature of the software collections, sorry. I was gonna say that the nature of the software collections does not mandate that you have 37 copies of Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I think dependent collections, right, uh, are a very real and very important aspect of this. That um, we're still working through some of the, like, there's a. I don't know where it's published right now, but we've been working on trying to get a, a good guideline for how to do dependent collections, right? So do you really want to do a Rails software collection? Well, not really, right? You want to do a Ruby software collection and then have a Rails software collection that depends on it, right? Um, so, and, and what, what's the right size of a software collection, right? What is, you know, should it be a full on, you know, kind of web server with you know, like I said, Ruby and Rails, or should it be, you know, piecemeal? Uh, and I think a lot of those questions, I think, are yet to be known. Um, the other thing I think that is going to be interesting about this is kind of the, the move towards containerization, right? So containerization, and I'm using that term to mean to be as far away from possible from any individual implementation, right? So you have things like Docker, you have LXC, you have um, you know this combination of open. Uh, we use an OpenShift, which is like C groups and SC Linux. Um, you have you have actually much older and much more sophisticated versions in other operating systems that are not Linux. Um, but the kind of this containerization concept where now we kind of say, hey, this whole application is now a blob and it's portable and we can run it into certain kinds of conditions and it can be updated on its own. I think that's going to be the next step for some of this stuff. And I think a lot of that will rely on something either exactly like software collections or something very similar. Because uh, it, it allows you to kind of bring that bundle inside you know, your container. Are you ready for questions? Yeah. All right. I've got a mic, so if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll bring the mic around so it turns up on the video later. Hi. Hey, um, uh, one thing I didn't follow, uh, if you've got two software collections installed for two different versions of something, say Ruby, uh, what's the mechanism by which the application uh, 
gets to use the appropriate version. So, so this versus like update alternatives. So the question was basically like, how do you say I want this application to use Ruby 1.9 and that application to use you know Ruby 2, right? So this, of course, is only at the very bottom of the screen here, so you probably can't see it. I should have probably put it at the top somewhere too. But um, this, unlike say like update alternatives, you you tell the application which one it's using, like, or you don't. The application doesn't actually know, but you say SCL enable whatever collection you want to use, and then the application you want to run. So that it's basically running it inside a shell of its own that has the kind of correct paths, so that it finds it as if it was um, at its normal locations. Right, so this is changing the environment? Essentially, yeah. Try to organize your questions by <laughs> row. <laughs> You I don't even know why I got up at 6.30 this morning to go to the fitness center at the hotel. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, how security updates are propag propagated to containerized applications in software collections. So say I have a Ruby software collection and Ruby depends on some library that got a security update upstream. Uh, does it mean that the maintainer of the collection will have to update it manually? And uh, if exactly. I have yeah. like five <laughs> collections which depend on this library, does it mean that five different people will have to update their collections to include the update? Exactly. Yeah, that's the problem. Not, not if you do dependencies, right? So, um, you know, like I said, if you use kind of, like, let's say you had a Rails 3 and a Rails 4, both dependent on the Ruby 1.9. Um, uh, software collection and the uh, you know the security update happened in the Ruby one you wouldn't have to update the rails ones in theory I think I mean one of the things that I like about software collections um, is it it kind of also lets you well like dislike I don't know but it, it also lets you defend kind of your QA problem right so one of the reasons that the enterprise doesn't want to upgrade uh, often it may be that they expect the code to completely work but they don't want to test it, right? They don't, QA resources are often the, the ones that you have the least of in any organization. It's often the constraint at any engineering organization I've ever worked with uh, that keeps features from happening. Um, and so when you're doing, again, kind of talking about that janky old app that is just running and doing its thing, why would you want to waste that very limited resource of your QA people um, to test the upgrade? So I, I also would hope that the, you know, if, I, I, I guess I kind of expect that in a particular enterprise, much like, much like I would kind of expect with OpenShift, is like in a particular enterprise, I would kind of expect them to build their own software collections for use in-house. Probably, depend, hopefully, right, dependent on, you know, for a large percentage, 90, 95% of the functionality on somebody else, right? So like on Red Hat or on the community in general or on something, but that they would have their own one so that they could be confident that the API layer at the top is what they expect completely for the applications that they're building. You know, it does two things. One, it gives them more, um, you know, kind of tolerance for moving across versions, but then it also does that kind of opposite effect, which then you can still control your developers by saying, here, here is the approved Ruby software collection, right? Here is the approved Python software collection. Don't go installing random other stuff unless it's made it into the software collection. Oh, one back there. Yeah, uh, I have a question on how this SCL enable uh, works. So um, can I use multiple of these uh, environments at the same yep. time? And uh, so it, will it sort of only map this for this one process with something like pwoot or, or mount bind? Or uh, how does it get into the um, environment? Yeah, it's um, so you separate it by a space, right? Um, but you, you can just kind of list out multiple ones that you want. Um, and it's not that cool. It's just paths, right? Uh, you know, so you know this, this is not you know trooting you know some brand new file system or something and and running in that context. There's no security here, right? None of that stuff. This is just to provide the environment that is uh, kind of so when you make a you know function call, you get the right binary. 
That's it. Yeah, so what is like the lowest level of libraries that you include? For example, these packages, would they include uh, libc? Or do you still expect that from the um, distribution itself? The, the package maintainer needs to decide that. Um, and ev everything that you don't include makes you less portable, right? But makes it so that you have less of the problem that he was talking about back there of massive redistribution updates. Yeah, but I think it's hard to know like all the pieces that you that you need. So I wouldn't even know, like, if I need Apache, I wouldn't even know all the libraries that it uses. So. Uh, well, I mean, there's the one aspect of you need to know what libraries you care about, right? Yeah. But then there's the other aspect of where's this fine line of how much stuff to include. Um, I think we're still struggling with that too. I think, you know, I don't, I don't think there is, well, I don't think there will ever be a silver bullet kind of answer. What we're trying to do is do a better job of documenting try, try how to think about it. Um, and there are starting to be a lot of examples, yeah. right? So now we have whatever, you know, 10 or 12 that we're shipping, um, you know, there's another, prob there's at least another five or 10 that I know about and kind of in the, the software world. So there's starting to be examples that are making decisions. I think we're also gonna run into problems. You know, it's, it's really nice actually that RHEL 7's kind of on its way out the door because that'll be the first test of some of this stuff. So, you know, I've, I'm running the beta here. And so what I'm, but it's only been like a couple of weeks. So what I want to do is start to try to run, take an application that I wrote on the software collection for Ruby on RHEL 6, run that hopefully unchanged on RHEL 7, and then I actually want to be able to run the same thing unchanged on OpenShift. Um, because OpenShift actually uses software collections uh, to, uh, that's how it delivers those blobs as well. Do I see a question over here? Yeah. No, no, he, he's first, then you, because that, that way he can keep walking the right direction. Yeah, <laughs> oh. She raised me. Thank you. <coughs> so um, I'm no uh, advanced coder. I'm not a coder at all, but I'm aware of uh, distributions and dependencies and versions and stuff. And I just want to uh, understand correctly what, uh, what this means. So uh, you say I can make a package of a software and include my own dependencies, what I need, and do it all uh, into the opt um, uh, system. Um, and all I need to do to make this work in any distribution is to uh, insert this uh, this SCL trick. Is that um, about correctly? So it's a little more complicated than that. So the first part is you have to create the thing. Right? So you have to have your application and all its dependencies, and then you have to shove that all into some sort of package. Uh, in, in the case that I'm talking about, that's all RPM. Mm -hmm. Then on deployment, so on install of the application is where the ops stuff comes in. So it's where it's gonna show up. Um, and then this kind of SCL stuff works because basically now you have all of the pieces that you need um, you know, some of it might be coming from the operating system itself, some of it might be coming from this set of packages called the software collection um, to actually deliver the API for, say, Ruby um, to another application, right? So we expect, and I know of a, a couple of uh, companies that are doing this, but we expect that some companies will kind of, you know, whether it's open source or proprietary, they're going to actually create their own application as a software collection, which will then have a dependent collection that they also carry, or a set of dependent collections, so that then the whole thing will kind of get installed there, but then you'll have that, you know, so when you install, you know, X, Y, and Z software, you actually get that whole collection uh, from them, and including any dependent collections that they're, they may get from elsewhere. So every package brings its own. Um, so every package brings its own environment completely. Right. So it it may rely on some stuff that's in the OS too, or it may not. It's up to the the package or the collection. Okay. Um, my question is: uh, Are you aware of uh, Nix and Guix uh, package managers? Because they are uh, doing similar job but I believe slightly better and without RPM. <laughs> um, so as I said kind of on that earlier slides, like 
everybody has had this problem a ton, all the time, right? Microsoft has a solution for this problem as well. This, I don't know if you guys know anything about .NET, but one of the major changes, uh, you may have remembered the advertising, was you know, .NET solved DLL hell. Right? And the way it did that was having this thing called the global cache and then a per application cache. And what ended up happening, they had this magical, mystical idea that in the global cache would be you know, things like glibc. What in fact happened is that every single application that got installed picked up their own. Right? Mac has always, and you know, to the best of my knowledge, and I don't know a whole lot about Mac packaging, but Mac has pretty much always worked this way in that every application basically carries its entire dependency tree every time you install it. Um, so, like, it's it's not limited to Linux, number one, and it's certainly not limited to the examples I gave. I don't actually know the one you mentioned, um, so I'll go ask Google. <laughs> okay, uh, and another thing, um, I didn't understand that. Uh, what are the new demands for software vendors to be able to use this? Well, so um, it's not. It's really just a style. It's a, a way of saying, hey, you know, this is a way you could deliver your application that, um, you know, because it, it, this, it, this happens to be RPM, right? But the same concept could work in anything, right? It doesn't really matter that much. Um, you just need kind of something like Yum to manage where they're coming from and getting updates. Um, but I, I think a software vendor of some kind could say, hey, here's a way to distribute it. And it might be easier for you to build the packages for, let's say, you know, Enterprise Linux 4, 5, and 6. They might be able to find a way to create a software collection that uh, will install on all of them, right? So that they don't have to recertify for every minor version, right? That they don't have to, you know, they, they can also deploy on Fedora, even though Fedora is way ahead of RHEL, right? That makes sense. Arguably. Any so, other? Oh. so I've got a question on. I suppose this goes back to how big the software collections are. But say you have a software collection for different versions of Rails and a software collection for different versions of Ruby, is this just to suggest that for every permutation you want, you would then need to build another independent software collection on top of that? Theoretically, that right. right. Uh, so theoretically, that's and that's the struggle, right? Is where. Where do you want to draw that line? So right now, for example, the, the one we built, right, this Ruby 193 actually includes Rails 3 as well. So even though it's called Ruby 193, there's actually, I don't know, 40, 30, some number of gems in there. I can't remember how many. Um, but a whole bunch, right? Which if, you, if I read Ruby 193, I don't hear gems, right? Um, so I'm not sure that we're entirely happy with that choice, that maybe Rails should have been separate. Because then it would have been easier for us to say, okay, now we have a Rails 3 um, software collection and a Rails 4 software collection, both dependent on the Ruby 193 software collection. Um, maybe I missed it when I was just looking at my phone during your talk or whatever. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Don. Um, I got, I'm curious about some of the details. Like how do you, how do people actually create these collections? How do they deliver them to users? Um, how do users install them, and how do they manage them? What, what do the tools look like in practice? Uh, so I was going to include some of the macros, but um, I decided not to. But basically. Um, when you're writing an RPM, right, you have this big thing called a spec file, um, which kind of describes what's in the RPM, right? Um, in that spec file, we just add some new macros that indicate that this is a software collection and that it's going to go kind of in a special place. And that's about it as far as the difference. Um, one thing that was kind of a design goal was that the same spec file, if it knew about software collections, um, could also be built to not be a software collection. So you should. So hopefully, what'll happen is that all spec files everywhere, right, will have uh, kind of the support for a software collection. So you could build it that way, or decide to not build it that way, depending on your use case. Um, and then, as far as the tools are concerned, it's just yum install, you know, x, y, and z, you know, software collection dot rpm, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be called. Though, you know, in uh, in enterprise Linux, uh, you have to add what's called a channel, which don't get me started on that. Um, but basically, you have to add another repo coming from Red Hat, and it's got a bunch of them in there. You just say yum install, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think CentOS, I think they're mainlined. Uh, did they make it to mainline, or are they still in test? They are, OK. Uh, so in CentOS, you can actually just 
log in, yum install Ruby 193. Um, so, so it's all the tools you're already familiar with for the most part. You know, they'll they'll work just like the, you know RPM does with Puppet. So it has also all the failings of RPM, but you know, it's easy. Hi. Um, do you have an example yet of an application that's packaged in the normal places, like in where a user would expect them, but it depends on an SCL? So, for example, you know, you r the user would run the application where it normally is, doesn't has never seen the SL SCL enable utility, but the application then enables the SCL it requires itself. Um, it's sort of, I, you know, basically. So I've done that with like HTTPD, right? So. Um, you know, to get the web server to use the Ruby 193 stuff, I need to kind of modify its its start script, um, and the, and I was for that particular example, I was using the native um, Apache web server rather than a software collection. Um, I think we want to be mildly careful of that um, because if that that's one of my fears is that you if you have something that is distributed by the normal OS that's dependent on a software collection. Um, that might be weird. Uh, you know, it's kind of it, it kind of goes out of the user's or when I say user here, right? The system administrator or developer's expectation of where stuff is going to show up. You know, where yes. to go find. So my assumption is it's it's distributed separately in a separate YUM repo, even maybe with an SCL. But when a user installs it, the application appears in its normal places, but it's using an right. SCL behind the scenes. Exactly. So th that's exactly what I did for like HVD. Um you know, do it if you want to set up a bash profile that it just runs, right? Uh, so, however, in general, if I had a like kind of a real top-level application, you know, so you know my cool website that runs in your office, um, I would rather that people package that as a software collection, and then Why? it's dependent on software. I, I think user expectation. Um, so, you know, I think having a shell script or something that's kind of off in a more normal place that points at it is fine, but I, I don't know, I guess I don't, I don't like if, some, if an application installs under opt, then it shouldn't touch the rest of the OS, right? If I choose to make it touch the rest of the OS, so an example, Calibre um, installs, if you install it from uh, the Python script, it installs under opt, it doesn't touch the normal operating system basically at all. Um, but I can put a sim link to it from user bin. Right? Sorry, it's just one technical ad. There's no reason you can't. I just, it's just, uh, that's my preference. Well, I don't know if you have already answered my question, but it's another twist on the situation. Let's say we have a Ruby a collection or a Python collection, and I want to add a particular a gem or Python module. I know how to uh, create a packet for a native envi environment. Can it be easily added to the existing collection? Do I have to create a new collection and, and overwrite or remove the previous one? Right, so um, that's exactly actually exactly the problem in some ways. We didn't really talk about it here, but um, the other thing that a dependent collection could or should be able to do, right, is we're talking about, uh, you know, the, we have the Ruby collection, which hap this one happens to include Rails, right? So let's say I want to write a dependent collection that swaps Ruby's, uh, I'm sorry, swaps Rails 3 and puts in Rails 4. Well, we don't want you to have to rebuild this one, right? So what we'd like, uh, one of the things that we're working on from a, it's, I think it's more of a documentation problem. Hopefully it's not a bug problem, but there's a documentation problem to say, okay, how do you write a dependent collection that swaps part of a collection, right? And does that make sense or is that completely insane? Um, <clears throat> I've got a question. Uh, does the software collection packages run independently from each other? Means if I run two at the same time, which have got a dependency inside, which breaks if they run at the same time, um, do they run independent of each other? So uh, I was kind of saying that earlier. Um, you can you can kind of. S so I had an example where I was doing. Uh, I think it was Postgres. So we have a Postgres software collection. So I had an app that used Postgres, uh, whatever, 9 something that we're shipping, and Ruby 1.9. Uh, so what I do here is I kind of say SEL enable Ruby 1.9 space Postgres bash. Okay, so that gives them both there. If there's a dependency between the two, 
then I think you should have a software collection that is dependent on the two. And then you use that software collection. If you follow me. So in the Rails, Ruby and Rails example, um, I wouldn't kind of run them both. I would have built the Rails one such that it's dependent. And then I would SCL enable Rails 4 bash. Yes, and, and it's just that one depends on the other rather than, than using both. The only time I would use both is because for my application, I need you know, two, three, four different pieces of software, you know, Postgres, Memcached, and Ruby. Okay, we have time for this one and one more. So the next question goes to whoever's gonna go get me a beer after the question. <laughs> Um, in the Red Hat developer blog, there was uh, this topic uh, one year ago. And uh, compared to this, uh, what's the news? Uh, not a lot. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, like I said, I, I actually what I what I do think we found, like kind of over the course, of, I mean, software collections have been now around what almost three years. Um, so what I think we're finding, particularly since we started shipping some stuff, you know, whatever a year and change ago. Um, is the problems people run into. So like this dependent collection problem. Uh, and so uh, you know, getting real world use you know, starts to poke some of the holes in it. Um, I think the other big stuff that's changing is, like I said, containerization uh, is, is already hugely important and becoming way more important. And how that integrates with packaging, I think, is also going to be a really interesting ride. Uh, Coming soon. Yeah, let's just say <laughs> uh, I would really, really like there to be kind of a proper upstream uh, for kind of software collections as a concept. It is all open source, but it's kind of like all over the place. So while it's open source, there's no practical means of finding it all, right? Unless you like work with the CentOS guys and are, have this magic ability to find things. Um, but so one of the things that we have in the works is to try to get kind of a landing place for software collections as a whole. And we've heard from people about the software collections that they've built that they would like other people to be able to use. And so kind of allow for a community to form around it. Um, you know, everybody's got lots of things to do. Any other questions? Apparently no one wants to give me a beer. <laughs> All right, thanks Langdon. You're welcome.